Hello again. So for chapter 19, I wanted to go over a few things. Um, first, starting with the blood flow of the heart through the chambers. Sorry, that's cut off. So the blood enters the heart from the superior and inferior vena cava. So these two major veins bring blood from the superior portion of the body, so above the heart, and from the inferior portions of the body that are below the heart into your right atrium, so that's its first start. So your blood flows through the heart in one direction, so this is regulated by the pumping of the heart as well as valves in certain places to prevent backflow. So once the blood has pulled up in your right atria, both atria contract at the same time, forcing blood into the ventricles. So in our case, starting with our right atria, the blood is pushed through the right AV valve into the right ventricle. So the time it takes for the ventricles to receive blood, there's a little bit of a pause before the ventricles contract. So when the ventricles contract, to prevent that blood from flowing back into the atria, the AV valves, and in our case particularly right now, the right AV valves has flaps that will close. So here at the bottom, you have these papillary muscles that are attached to the chordae tendinae or the heartstrings, also, also known as the tendinous cords. When these muscles contract, they'll pull on those chordae tendinae and prevent the flaps of the AV valves from flying back open and opening up into the atrium. So as your ventricles are contracting, pushing blood, it's actually being sealed in and prevented from going back into the atria. So it's like that flap of the AV valve and here's your heart string, so it's kind of imaginary in our case. So those papillary muscles pull on those heart strings to prevent that flap of that valve from flying back open. So when the ventricles um, contract and starting staying with our right ventricles, the blood is pushed through the pulmonary semilunar valve, so pulmonary because it's going to the lungs. So these valves here are another place where there's a control of the flow of blood. So ventricles contract, push through those valves and on its way out to the lungs. So through the pulmonary trunk into the left and right pulmonary arteries, so going towards the lungs. So these blood vessels, although um, blue, and still being considered an artery, it's because they have deoxygenated blood. So that's how it color codes it. So blood goes to the lungs, exchanges your CO2 for oxygen, then returns to the heart through your pulmonary veins. So you have a left and a right pulmonary veins. Um, sorry, let me go back to these... Uh, semilunar valves, so after your ventricles contract and when the ventricles relax again, the valves, and from this picture I can see them, so they kind of look like half moons, that's why they're called lunar, they fly open when the blood is pushed through, but then when the ventricles relax, they close in on each other and prevent blood from coming back through from the pulmonary trunk back into the ventricle. So after it's circulated through the lungs and come back to the heart through the pulmonary veins, it enters into your left atria. So it's a small chamber here. Then the atria contracts, so both contracting at the same time, pushing through the left AV valve, again controlled by those heart strings and papillary muscles. So when your atria contracted, your ventricles are relaxed, which also mean these papillary muscles are relaxed, so allowing those... Uh, flaps of those valves to um, be pushed open by the atria. 
But then when ventricles con contract, so also causing the papillary muscles to contract, pulling down on those chordae tendini, and therefore um, preventing the AV valves from flying back open. So ventricles contract, and in our case, looking at our left ventricle, which has this big, nice, thick layer of muscle because it's sending blood throughout the rest of the body compared to the smaller bit of muscle for your right ventricle, which only sends it to the lung, and even smaller amounts for your atria. So ventricles contract. Your blood goes from your left ventricle out through the aorta and then out to the rest of the body. Okay, moving on to how the heart actually contracts. So there are special cells in this area of the heart called your sinoatrial node or SA node. So these specialized cardiomyocytes have um, a unstable resting membrane potential that causes them to fire at a regular interval. So when these cells fire, they cause both of the atria to contract together. So the signal spreads through the atria, through the gap junctions in the, between the cardiomyocytes. So on this bottom, bottom portion, you have this um, section that's in between the two cells, so your intercalated disc. So here in this kind of darker blue color are a gap junction, so it's just a hole in between or pore in between the cells where ions and nutrients can flow easily through the cell, which allows your cardiomyocytes to easily um, pass the signal through and therefore work together as one unit. So back to our heart. Once the signal has traveled through the atria, the signal then ends at the atrioventricular node or AV node. So this is another set of pacemaker cells which are triggered to fire but because there are fewer gap junctions between these cells, the signal slows down, which allows time for the ventricles to be filled with blood. So your atria have been contracted, the blood is flowing into the ventricles. Um, the signal slow down to allow time for those ventricles to fill up. So during the meantime, uh, the signal slowly travels through your AV node, then moves through the bundle of His, or also known as the atrioventricular bundle. So through here, um, between your two ventricles, the travel, the sorry, the signal will travel, eventually reaching the apex of the heart. So down at the bottom tip, where then they'll start to signal the ventricular muscles as well as the papillary muscles to contract by traveling through the subendocardial conducting networks. So as that signal travels, travels very quickly through your ventricular muscle, allowing for your ventricles to fire at nearly the same time, moving from your apex towards the base of your heart. So in doing so, it allows the ventricles to pump blood out of the heart, so going up the pulmonary trunk and towards the lungs or up the aorta and out the body. And it does so in a ringing motion because of the spiral orientation of the um, cardiomyocytes. So the arrangement of the muscle is like a spiral. So it causes a ringing motion of the heart and it twists up to pump the blood out. So here is the membrane potential of the pacemaker cells, so the ones at the SA node that cause, can cause the, causes the heart to have the initial start for causing contractions. So these cells don't have a stable resting membrane, so instead of their resting membrane being stable until they're signal, signaled to go, 
There's a slow inflow of sodium, which causes the cell to go from negative 60 millivolts to becoming more and more positive due to the positive sodium ions that are flowing in. So as these ions flow in, causing the cell to become more positive, eventually reaching the threshold level of negative 40, these cells will then fire. So the calcium and sodium voltage-gated ion channels will open, causing a sharp influx in positive ions into the cell, making the cell even more and more positive, eventually maxing out at about 0 millivolts. At this time, those voltage-gated ion channels will close, so calcium and sodium, and then your potassium voltage-gated ion channels will then open, causing the potassium to be repelled by the positive charge inside of the cell, and your potassium will flow out of the cell, repolarizing the cell, so go from depolarization to repolarization, going back down to your resting membrane potential. So unlike your neurons, your cardiomyocytes do not have that hyperpolarization before going back to its resting membrane potential. So once it's back at its resting membrane potential, those sodium ions will start inflowing again, which makes the cell more and more positive, reaching threshold, and again going through depolarization, through repolarization, and starting back that process again. So moving to the membrane potentials of just a regular cardiomyocyte, so not a pacemaker cell. So once these cells are signaled, so receive that um, stimulation, voltage-gated sodium channels open, which causes a sharp um, inflow of sodium, making the cell very positive very quickly. Um, this is due to a positive feedback cycle that opens more and more sodium voltage-gated ion channels as more sodium is added to the cell. So more sodium in uh, causes more ion channels to open, therefore causing even more sodium to come in, causing even more channels to open. So your membrane potential peaks about uh, 20 positive 20 millivolts, and instead of going from an immediate depolarization to a repolarization in your cardiomyocytes, once you've reached your um, peak, calcium enters through slow calcium channels, so these um, keep the cell at a more positive end for its membrane potential. So it falls a little bit, but still keeps it positive. And during that section, it's called plateau. Some of this uh, membrane potential falling is because uh, potassium starting to leak out of the cell, but because so much calcium is coming in, it keeps the charge positive. So eventually those calcium channels will close, and as those calcium channels close, um, your potassium channels will then open. So as those channels open, allowing the potassium to rush out the cell, therefore repolarizing the cell and going back to a resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts. So how do, does the myocardial contraction and reaction work during this process? So during plateau, when you have all that calcium coming into the cell and also uh, causing the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if you remember from the chapter where we did muscle physiology, the sarcoplasmic reticulum wraps around those muscle fibers and acts as a storage facility for the calcium in your muscle fibers, so once those are released, they'll bind to that troponin molecule, allowing those actin subunit sites to, on the thin filaments, yeah, thin filaments to be exposed, so they're able to be bound to by the myosin heads on the thick filaments, and therefore causing the contraction. So you have your contraction starting here during plateau, 
and then once those calcium channels close and the uh, calcium moves back into the sarcoplasm reticulum, then your cardiomyocytes will then go through a relaxation. Moving on to your electrocardiogram. So this is a recording of the electrical activity in your heart. This is what a normal one looks like. So continuing the little beep sound if you've ever been to a hospital. Um, this is the electrical recording for a full contraction and relaxation. So the full cardiac cycle of the heart. So both ventricle, sorry, both, oh, sorry. All four chambers of the heart contracting and relaxing. So one whole cardiac cycle can be seen in this portion. So you have your P wave, that's your atria that are depolarizing and repolarizing. Then here you have in the PR interval, that's when your atria will contract. Next portion is the QRS complex. So that's that giant spike in the electrocardiogram, so also known as a ECG, or until very recently, just called an EKG. So this is when the ventricles are depolarizing, so their first initial swing up in its membrane potential. Oh, you can't see that. Okay, so as the membrane potential rises, that's this complex, so the QRS complex. So as they're starting to depolarize and then moving on to the T wave, which is where they're repolarized, you have the QT inf interval. That's where your ventricles contract, more specifically in between your S and T. Um, portion of the wave where the ventricles are contracting. So here I marked it on the wave, that ST segment, so where the ventricles are contract, so systole is for contraction, diastole is relaxation. So this ST um, ST segment also corresponds to the plateau in a myocardial action potential. So picture version adding the ECG waveforms to what's happening in the heart. So you have your first P wave, so your atria are depolarizing. After your P wave, depolarization is complete and your atria are contracting, so you see the little dents in the atria as they're contracting and pushing blood into your ventricles. So at the start of your QRS complex, your ventricles start to depolarize and your atria um, are start to repolarize, so becoming more negative. Ventricle um, cardiomyocytes becoming more positive. So once after the ventricles have been depolarized. Eventually, they'll uh, contract. So during that ST segment there. Um, then you move on to your T wave where after your ventricles have contracted and starting to relax, the ventricles will then repolarize, so becoming more negative. And then eventually that just spreads to from the apex and towards the base of the heart. Okay, so movement of blood through the heart is governed by pressure as well as some by resistance. So at the top we have a syringe and by pulling back on the plunger of the syringe, you're increasing the volume of this chamber on the inside which causes a decrease in its pressure. So as the pressure decreases, the fluid moves from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. So the lower pressure is inside that chamber, so therefore it fills that chamber. So the opposite, when you push on the plunger, causing more pressure inside the chamber, which forces your fluid or air, in this case, to go from high concentration to low concentration. 
So there's four phases of the cardiac cycle. First phase is ventricular filling. So that's during diastole, so diet the diast part as like as in dilate or relaxing of the ventricles. So as the ventricles expand, so in our syringe um, example where that plunger is being pulled away from the tip causing the increase in volume in that chamber, the ventricles expand, so making their volume increase, which causes their pressure to drop. So as the pressure drops, then the <clears throat> fluids allow to flow from a high concentration area where your atria are contracting to a low or pressure where your ventricles have expanded, causing a pressure drop. So during this time, the AV valves are open because the um, atria have enough pressure pushing on those valves to force them open. So sort of like when you are squeezing on a clogged up ketchup bottle where it comes out really fast at first, but then eventually slows down. You have rapid ventricular filling, it's doing that initial pressure burst diastasis where it slows down a little bit. And then finally, the last one where your atria have the last final push, uh, gets that last one third of the volume of the atria into your ventricles. For the second phase of the cardiac cycle is isovolumetric contraction. So this is where the ventricles are compressing, so pushing on the chambers of uh, the, it's their ventricles. So muscles are pushing on those chambers, causing a higher pressure in this area. But there's no flow of blood because the pressure hasn't become greater than the pressure in either the pulmonary trunk or aorta and the pulmonary valves or aortic valve hasn't been pushed open so it's same volume so iso for same and then of course volume is just the volume of it so your first heart sound so the lub is occurs at that phase because of the closure of your av valves so these close causing that first sound. So on to the third phase of the cardiac cycle. So once your ventricles contract enough to have enough pressure to cause the movement of the fluid from its high pressure area in the ventricles through those semilunar valves to either the aorta or the pulmonary trunk, that's when you have ventricular ejection, which is the third phase of your cardiac cycle. So this is the actual movement of the blood out of the ventricles. So again, first a rapid ejection. So rapid push out, like when you first squeeze that ketchup bottle. And then it slows down um, with lower pressure. So as the blood leaves those ventricles, there's less pressure in those ventricles because it's no longer pushing on as much substance. So lower pressure, the ejection slows down. So this ejection lasts about 200 to 250 milliseconds. So during that plateau phase of the cardiac action potential. So you have your depolarization and then that plateau and then your repolarization. So during the plateau phase. So at the end of this phase is your T wave. So that last little final bump on the ECG. Your last phase is isovolumetric relaxation. So this is where the T wave is ended. Your ventricles begin to expand again um, so after they've contracted and squeezed the blood out. The blood from your aorta and pulmonary trunk flows backwards and closes those semilunar valves. So these are pushed on by the, the pressure here in those arteries. So these semilunar valves then close. So as those valves close, it causes the second heart sound to occur. 
So in this fourth phase and final phase of the cardiac cycle, you have your same volume relaxation. So as your ventricles are relaxing, but they're not filling with blood, so they have the same volume. Um, so no flow of blood has happened between the atria and the ventricles. So no fl flow of blood into the ventricles from the um, atria. So when there's enough pressure for the AV valves to open again, that starts your cardiac cycle again, and therefore getting going back towards your ventricular filling. Ignore the stuff about the Wigger's diagram. Then go over that. Okay, so I want to go to this last bit dealing with balancing of ventricular output. So having both your right and left ventricles pushing out the same amount of volume um, causes um, problems if they're not balanced. So, for example, in our right ventricle, if the right ventricle um, pu pushes out more blood than your left one, then if you remember from our capillary dynamics where the net filtration pressure is the pressure that pushes fluid out of the capillaries and therefore into the tissue space. So if your right ventricle has a higher blood pressure causing more blood pressure in the arteries of your arteries of your um, on the arterial side of those capillaries. So if you remember that the net filtration pressure is a combination of your blood pressure as well as the hydrostatic pressure of your tissues. So that increase in blood pressure causes more fluid to go into the lungs, causes the lungs to swell up since it doesn't have a fast enough drainage to remove those fluids back from into the pulmonary veins or through the lymphatic system when we learn about it. So same true goes with the left ventricle. So if the left ventricle pushes out too much, pushes out more blood than your right, you end up having more uh, more blood pressure into the aorta, eventually having more blood pressure on the arterial side of your capillary. So pushing out more fluid into those tissue spaces. So the tissues begin to swell because um, that fluid accumulates there, so causing edema. So therefore causing other issues and problems because you don't have, have the ability to drain that fluid away from the tissues. Okay, so that's it for chapter 19. Um, I'll next do one for the capillary dynamics, so that PowerPoint that's already on Blackboard. Again, your vessels exam for my online class is next weekend when we do our first meeting for lab. And so I want to make sure you guys had a full lecture from that more than just reading it from the slides. Again, um, message me if you have any questions. I'm always here. All right, thanks. Bye.